Thank you. Thank you again. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Nancy Speck, who will speak to us on her career as a civilian with the Niagara Regional Police in the area of crime analysis. When I first spoke to Nancy about two and a half years ago, she was newly retired, but her passion for crime analysis was very evident. It sounded so interesting that I suggested Nancy as a speaker for our probus group. <clears throat> Nancy was born into a policing family and raised in South St. Catharines with two brothers and one sister, whose parents were Judy and David Gittings. Many of you will remember Dave as a longtime probus member who passed away in 2019. Nancy attended Grantham High School and graduated in 1976. She attended Brock University for one year in the Bachelor of Science program, intending to become a veterinarian, but by the end of the year had determined that such a career was not for her. So she joined the Niagara Regional Police as a civilian. In her presentation, Nancy will expand on many more details of her career with the Regional Police. In May 2011, Nancy received a Civilian Achievement Award from Ontario Women in Law Enforcement. That was the first time that a Niagara Regional Police civilian staffer had been honored with a provincial award. In the same year, she was nominated for and received a Civilian Achievement Award from the International Association of Women Police. Nancy has been given high praise by then Chief of the NRP, Wendy Southall. Chief Southall recognize, recognized Nancy's expertise in crime analysis, her commitment, her long hours put in to upgrade her knowledge and skills and her passion for her job. Nancy retired in 2019. She is married to Joe, a retired farmer, and they have two kids and three grandchildren. And Nancy loves playing pickleball and doing Pilates. I didn't even know what those were. <laughs> Please give Nancy a warm probus, probus welcome as she tells us about her career with the NRP and her work there. Thank you. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay, thank you, John. <clears throat> Good morning, gentlemen. And I'm here today to speak to you I'm here today to speak to you about my police and career, and in particular, the over 20 years I spent as a divisional crime analyst. First of all, I'd like to apologize in advance. I've not spoken to a large gathering for many years, and between retirement and the pandemic, I may be a little rusty. Um, hopefully, my speech will be interesting enough that you won't notice. I began my career with an Niagara Regional Police Service in February 1979. Having been brought up in a police household, it seemed natural that I would work there as well. I always dreamed, however, of becoming a veterinarian. I grew up listening to police stories and after my year at Brock, when I changed my mind, I decided that I'd love to be involved in policing, though maybe not as a police officer. Many of you knew my father, Dave Giddings, and he retired after 40 years. My youngest brother, Rob, was also a police officer for 22 years before his untimely death of leukemia at 44 years old. Initially, I worked in the detective office for a few months and then moved to our central records. I was a CPIC operator, that's the Canadian Police Information Centre, for five years prior to having my first child. I then resigned from the service to stay home with my eventually two daughters. Uh, at the time I was married to a police officer and we had been working shift work. And in those days it was cheaper and easier to just stay home. 
A short time later, though, I was offered a job in our intelligence unit, where I worked on a part-time basis for six years. I was involved in many large investigations there, and it was then that I first heard the term crime analysis. In 1992, I was working on the Green Ribbon Task Force, which those of you from the area know was the investigation into murders by Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka. There, I was introduced to two crime analysts. One was an, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer, and the other was an OPP officer. I immediately knew this would be the perfect job for me. At the time, a senior officer told me that I would never become an analyst because I was a woman and I was a civilian. <laughs> and of course, that made me work harder to get to my goal. Unfortunately, the poor man died of cancer before we formed our unit, but I made sure I told him anyway. I returned to the St. Catharines Detective Office in 1994 and began to look for linkages in the day-to-day -day crimes, in addition to my administrative duties. A detective showed me a chart that another police service had made up for a series of robberies, and he asked me to do something similar for some bank robberies that we were having. I was excited to do that, and the chart helped to put everything together when an arrest was made. I was totally hooked on the concept of analysis. I also had the opportunity to fill in for the superintendent secretary around this time. And in 1999, this enabled me to be part of a team looking into this fairly new realm of crime analysis for our service. I was also involved in helping to create some of the software and computer programs that we began to use. Also at this time, I heard of a group of crime analysts in Southern Ontario who met every other month to compare crimes and trends in their areas. I asked the superintendent if I could attend these meetings and he knew that this was my interest. So um, after I told him that I would make up for the time away on my own time, I was given permission and joined the group. I immediately found the uh, meetings to be a great source of valuable information, both in how to do the actual job, since we didn't have an analysis unit yet, and comparing crimes and trends across all the regions. This group continues to this day and is a fabulous resource. I spoke to with many of these fellow analysts on a daily, if not weekly, basis. It was at one of these first meetings that I attended that I was able to show the officers with whom I worked just how valuable crime analysis could be. We had a male in St. Catharines who was approaching very young girls. They were between six and 12, but the older ones were quite small and exposing himself to them. Although the MO or modus operandi appeared similar, the descriptions of the vehicles was always quite different. And since none of the young victims was able to record any license plate numbers for many of those incidents, we really had nothing to go on. However, similar incidents started occurring in Grimsby as well, just off the QEW highway. I reasoned that the mail was traveling and thought I would bring it up at the next regional crime analyst meeting. The day after the meeting, I received a phone call from an analyst in Peel region. She told me that she had mentioned my case to some of their detectives who told her that, in fact, they did have the same type of incidents. However, they had a suspect who lived in St. Catharines and delivered cars back and forth to a car dealership in Mississauga. It fit with all the details and the male was arrested soon after. He was charged with several counts of indecent act, both in Mississauga and in the Niagara area, and he was eventually convicted on all counts. It was rather amusing to me because the detective in charge of our case sent out a media release stating that the case had been solved with the assistance of a Niagara Region Police crime analyst, when in fact, officially, we didn't even have any at that time. I, of course, was really fucked down and spent the next two years updating my computer skills and learning everything I could about the world of crime analysis. I also applied for and was given the opportunity to take two courses at the Canadian Police College in Ottawa, Intelligence Analysis and Strategic Analysis. I have forged many friendships with analysts from all over Canada through these courses. Then in October 2001, the unit was officially formed and I applied for the job. I had to pass a computer test in advanced software applications, 
which took four hours and was held at Niagara College, and be formally interviewed. I got one of the two positions and then began my new job officially on January 1st, 2002. I like to think of my analysis job as working on a giant jigsaw puzzle, which I love. All the information I could take in from multiple sources are the pieces of the puzzle, and I tried to fit them together to get the complete picture. It was a wonderful challenge, and I loved going to work every day. So I was in one district, the analyst for one district. So one district is St. Catharines, Thorold, Lincoln, Grimsby, and West Lincoln. Uh, we also have two districts, which is Niagara Lake, Niagara Falls, and Fort Erie, and th three districts, which is Pelham, Welland, Port Colbert, and Wainsley. So in my areas, I had the biggest city in the region and a very large rural population, um, and the QEW Highway, which is basically the corridor running from Toronto, Hamilton through. So we got a lot of different kinds of crime. And at the time I was living uh, with my husband on his farm in West Lincoln, and I was a St. Catharines girl. So it made sense for me to take those areas because I was familiar with them. I began my day reading every call for service in my area, which is a large area. This averaged between 150 in January and three, at least 300 calls a day in other times of the year, depending on it. I then read over every report generated by the police in those areas. The calls for service and reports are where a lot of criminal information is gleaned, and I have large files on all known active criminals, including their most recent addresses, vehicles, friends, associates. That way, if an officer was looking for someone, I could provide him with the most up-to-date information. Other information would come directly from the police officers themselves. I worked in the middle of the largest detective office in the region and was constantly discussing crimes and suspects with the detectives. I got into the office about 7.15 every morning so I could speak with the uniform officers who were finishing their overnight shift. They would fill me in on anything of interest that had happened. Of course, as I mentioned before, information also came from other police services, especially the neighboring ones like Hamilton, Alton, Peel, and the various Ontario Provincial Police Detachments. Many criminals tend to be quite mobile and think they can get away with crime in different areas. But thanks to crime analysis and my rapport with the other police services, that was often not the case. This information is shared with police officers verbally through conversations, phone calls, as well as texts and emails, and also in written form in a weekly crime report I would prepare. Any crime trends, active criminals, recently paroled criminals, robberies, break and enters, auto thefts, all go into this report to keep officers up to date on what is occurring in their patrol areas on a weekly basis. This is especially helpful if they've been off work for a week or so to help them catch up on what had occurred while they were off. In addition, I would view surveillance video from crime scenes and obtain still pictures of suspects, their clothing, vehicles, etc., to immediately get out to the officers on the road. I also kept track of all parolees and persons on probations. Often, soon after I was notified of a high-risk release, the person would reoffend and be sent back to jail. I tried to notify officers that these people were out of custody in case they did reoffend, as well as look out for crimes that they may be back to committing. In addition to the reports, I also attended monthly meetings with local parole officers to discuss mutual information. One day in 2002, I was driving past the halfway house and noticed a male outside having a smoke. I recognized him as having been arrested a few months before for robbing pharmacies. I found out he had just been released the night before and I hadn't yet known that he was out. I told the detectives in my office, we're in for another pharmacy robbery any day. In fact, about 10 days later, he was a bit slow, uh, a pharmacy in Font Hill was robbed and I told the officers there that I believed this male was responsible. The MO was the same as he had used in previous robberies and the basic description of the suspect fit. 
He was later arrested along with another male who had been paroled with him on the same day. They had apparently been planning the robbery while in jail, and they were both charged with robbery and convicted. Reading the reports can also match up information to solve a crime. We had a young teen who was with his mother at the St. Catharines downtown library. The boy had his bike and was about to get on it to ride home while his mother walked. A male approached him and struggled to take the bike. He held something in his hand and told the boy it was mace. He also showed the boy a wallet and told him he was a security officer. He told the boy that if he didn't give him his bike, he would spray him with the mace. The boy complied, gave him his bike, and the male left. On reading the reports the next day, I came upon a landlord-tenant dispute where the police had been called. The landlord told the police that the male tenant had produced something in his hand and told the landlord he would spray him with mace if he didn't go away. So, because these two reports happened on the same day within a half mile of each other, I checked into the suspect in question. He had a criminal record and his basic physical description fit the suspect of the theft of the bike. A photo lineup was done, the male was picked by the teen as the person who stole his bike, and he was charged and convicted. I kept a database of break and enters as well as auto thefts to track these crimes and notify the officers of any increase or spikes in certain areas, often by it, the, uh, determining the area and specific time of day or day of the week, I could advise the officers where and when they should set up surveillance. On one occasion, there was a huge increase in auto thefts in Ford. Officers came to me with their suspicions about who might be involved. I put this information, as well as their photos and addresses in the weekly crime report. Within two weeks, eight teens had been arrested for a number of serious charges, and the auto theft problem stopped. This also applies, of course, to break and enters. By reading the reports and entering them into my analysis database, I could see spikes in activity. And again, the when, where, and how often lead to the who. Also, a printed synopsis chart of each break and enter was often used to clear crimes when the suspects were arrested. When they knew they were caught red-handed, the accused persons often would clear other similar crimes, admitting to them with a promise that they would not be charged. During the mid-2000s, I noted a series of commercial break and enters of businesses in my area. I started the chart as usual and began to keep an eye on them. I also checked with my fellow analysts for similar incidents in their areas. In addition, I watched for alerts from surrounding police um, services describing similar incidents. As the number of crimes increased, I told the detectives I had a major series occurring and that I believed I knew who the main suspect was. After some initial skepticism, the officers agreed with me that I did have the right person. I also let detectives and other services know who my suspect was. He was eventually arrested, and although he refused to admit to the over 65 business break and enters I believed he had done, they stopped and didn't start up again. He was told that we knew he had done them all, and this brought them to an end. He was charged and convicted of other crimes. Another time I had a few daytime residential break and enters. The victims were elderly and vulnerable which I never liked, um, which for me was the most concerning part of these crimes. I noted that the suspect yelled fire or something similar if he found one of the victims home when he entered, which terrified these people. I remember one poor elderly male victim was blind and in his panic, he couldn't find the door to escape. The entries then stopped for the next few years. I think it was about three years they stopped. However, one day, I was going through the calls and lo and behold, I had a daytime break and enter where the suspect yelled fire. I told the street crime sergeant that this was familiar and by going through my previous year's charts was able to find the previous similar entries. When the suspect was arrested, he was amazed that we knew about those previous crimes. And, and um, when I worked in the detective office before they built the new headquarters in Niagara Falls, the interview rooms for the suspects was in my office. So 
I loved it because then I would see these people get marched up from the cells and into an office. And I could see them in person as opposed to just from a mugshot. My poor husband has had to put up with me over the years going, oh, there's so-and-so, oh, there's so-and-so. And he's always like, oh, come on. But anyway, yeah, he has been very supportive. Yeah. <laughs> I was the only one that was disappointed when they moved all the cells to the new Niagara Falls office and I couldn't see them anymore. I also attended crime scenes to further my information gathering. I was on my way to work one morning and saw police cruisers in a mall on my route. Being nosy, I stopped by and after seeing broken glass all over, it was briefed by the uniform officers. Two businesses had been broken into overnight. I went into the one store and asked to view the surveillance video. I noted that a car which had parked out front and was used by the suspects, um, but I, that I recognized it and knew it was stolen and had, had been involved in other recent entries, both in Niagara and in Hamilton. Uh, I also had a possible suspect from the video and quickly got to the office and on the phone to the other analysts. Um, the spree continued for a little bit longer, but then the suspects were arrested and the entry stopped. Another time, I accompanied detectives to a downtown bank which had just been robbed. After viewing the surveillance video at the scene, I was able to confirm that the suspect had done two other recent bank robberies and uh, the suspect was arrested a short time later. If we had a series of any particular serious crimes, such as robberies, I also made up charts so that each officer was aware of what robberies had occurred, where and when they occurred, the MO and description, and possibly when they might happen again. If we had a large number of robberies, it would really help to have a short, uh, them in a short chart form where officers could see at a glance what was happening and know who was assigned to each case. I would have one main document with tabs of charts, which I believed were linked. When someone was arrested, it made clearing the crimes much easier. Also, if someone admitted to a robbery or similar crime, it was easier to link the occurrences up with their confessions. The officers would usually take one of my charts into the interview room when they were questioning the suspect, and then they could just say, we know you did these, and they would usually fold. I was also a resource of information to officers from other divisions and other police services. It was convenient for those officers needing information to go to the analysts, sort of a one-stop shopping. Our officers also used my analyst contacts to coordinate with investigators from other services. As an example, an officer from Niagara Falls called me to inquire about associates of a male and a particular vehicle. They had had a shoplifting where the male suspect had been approached by the store manager. A violent struggle had ensued and the suspect eventually got away, minus his shirt and coat. When the officer gave me the name of another male associate and the description of the suspect, I was able to give him the name of a male I knew to associate with that other male and who also matched the description. He was arrested later that afternoon. The male at first denied any knowledge of the shoplifting incident. However, when told he was being charged with robbery because of the associated violence, um, the male replied, why? Robbery? He got all the items back. <laughs> I think they're not all really smart. <laughs> I was also invited to attend strategy and information meetings with detectives from other services, usually involving major uh, crime spree investigations. I was asked my opinions and presented information I had to the other officers. This was a great source of pride for me because I was still only a female civilian. I'm sure all of you have heard about the prostitution problem in St. Catharines, mainly the Queen Street area, Queenston Street area. For several years, I maintained a photo list of all known prostitutes. The officers would all uh, often refer to those photos to try and identify someone they had seen on the scroll or in the prostitute area. Because these people tend to become somewhat transient, this helped a lot to identify unknown suspects. To that end, I would take walks on my lunch hour down to this area to see for myself what was happening. One day, I walked down Queenston Street towards the former General Hospital around one o'clock in the afternoon. 
By the time I got to the Delta Bingo area, five different men had pulled their vehicles beside me, obviously looking for action. I was dressed in a suit, and I didn't feel I looked like one of the working girls by any stretch of the imagination, considering they're mostly drug addicts and really rough looking. When I went back to work, I told the detectives I could have made a lot of money on that walk. However, it was very disturbing to me that women were not safe to walk down the main street in this city, especially during the afternoon. <laughs> because of many complaints by area residents and store owners, several hooker sweeps were done and several people arrested. This settled the problem down a little bit, but unfortunately, it seems there will always be a market for this activity. I would hope that women can safely walk down most streets in St. Catharines without being harassed and bothered by males looking for sex. And these days, with the internet and porn websites, the activity is mainly done in hotels. Another database I kept was for nicknames or street names, as unfortunately many criminals are only known by these. It makes it difficult to identify them as their associates really don't know their real names. By keeping that database, um, I would often get phone calls from officers asking if I knew who so-and-so might be. I could often give them a name, which really helped. Tattoos are another great identifier, and so many people sport them these days. I had an analyst call me from Peel Region one day to tell me that a male they had in custody, who had, they had a male in custody who had tried to steal jewelry from a store. He was arrested nearby and had assaulted a female officer. The male had a tattoo on his neck, which I was able to identify as belonging to a male from St. Catharines who was very well known uh, to me as an active criminal. I sent a mugshot of him to the analyst. He was quickly identified and charged. Since I had all this information in one place, it was always my responsibility to let officers know of any officer safety issues. To that end, I sent out usually via email and printed posters, known violent and active criminals and their associates wanted posters and basic criminal information. Further, I also kept lists of known active drug houses, including persons running them and people frequenting them. The officers needed to know these addresses to help combat the problem, as well as the obvious officer safety issues when dealing with these potentially violent people. As I used to tell the uniform officers, they had all the answers. They just didn't know what the questions were all the time. And my job was to link the questions with the answers to make everyone's job a little bit easier. I have two examples of which I am especially proud. We had a violent home invasion robbery in St. downtown St. Catharines, which appeared to be drug related, as they usually are. There was little information on the two suspects at the time of the initial report. However, information later came in with a possible description of the suspect vehicle and where it was frequenting. I quickly remembered having a street check, seen a street check, yeah, before they were banned, about a similar vehicle and knew that the driver of that vehicle had a girlfriend whose parents lived where that vehicle was supposed to have been. I gave the information to the investigating detective, and after some further investigation, the suspect was arrested and eventually convicted. A second, second suspect was also arrested a short time later and also convicted. Another time, there was a report of two males committing robberies and extortions of migrant farm workers. The description included that they appeared to speak Russian. I knew of two brothers, originally from Bulgaria, who grew up in St. Catharines. These males were very violent, and certainly this would, type of crime would be right up their alley. I gave the detective the information, knowing that Bulgarian and Russian would probably sound pretty similar to most people, and along with my knowledge of the background of these males. She was avail eventually able to arrest and convict those two. They were subsequently deported back to Bulgaria, and of interest, both brothers were later arrested in Greece for committing a contract murder hit. Good to get them out of Canada, for sure. All pieces of a puzzle that happened to fit together nicely.
In addition to taking several courses at both the Canadian and Ontario Police Colleges and attending workshops at police services throughout Ontario and the New York State, I also enrolled in an online crime analysis diploma program at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. This took me six years to complete, in addition to working full time and taking care of my family. I then continued my education, receiving my papers as a certified crime and intelligence analyst through the California Justice Department in 2012. And in 2013, I was certified as an intelligence crime analyst through the International Association of Law Enforcement Intelligence Analysts. Further, in 2012, I completed an introduction to GIS, or Geographic Information Systems course, at Mohawk College in Hamilton. Mapping has become a huge tool in crime analysis. I originally began using whatever mapping tools were available on the internet, but by the time I retired, we were using a powerful GIS mapping program purchased by the service. The analysis unit personnel needed to be trained a lot on this program, but it made the job of mapping so much easier and produced a nice product to assist officers and for use as a tool in court. This program also enabled me to take a large amount of data and parse it down to a small subset. For example, looking at all collisions that have occurred in one intersection for our traffic investigators. Crime analysis is an ever evolving science and has an analyst needs to constantly update his or her skills and education to stay current. These days, many criminals travel great distances to commit their crimes. For example, we have crime groups that travel around Southern Ontario shoplifting at LCBO stores. And I mean, thousands of dollars that they can snatch. We also have groups that travel to tourist and hotel areas, stealing wallets and credit cards from bags they find hanging on the back of victims' chairs. Another group are well known for approaching mainly elderly and vulnerable adults claiming to be looking for a hospital or being out of gas and offering jewelry to their victims as a thank you. However, the victim is left without their own valuable ring or necklace, replaced by cheap junk without even realizing what is happening. These crime groups are harder to track and require more mapping expertise, communication, and cooperation among the analysts of all police services. In addition to my continuing education, I received several awards for my crime analysis work. In May 2010, I received the James A. Gator Civilian Award. And as John had noted, I won the um, Ontario and International Women Police Civilian Award. In 2000, December 2012, I was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for my charitable work in the service and as a director with the Niagara Region Police Association. And in both 2007 and 2019, I received the Niagara Region Police Association Civilian of the Year Award. I retired in April 2019 after nearly 40 years with the Niagara Region Police Service, just like my father. Yeah, I died a month later. While it was hard to leave, I knew it was time to carry on with other joys in my life including traveling, helping out my husband's glass art business, and with my grandchildren. All in all, I loved my job and went to work each day with a smile on my face. I loved starting out with a new unit in 2002 and helping our unit gain recognition for the science of crime analysis. I loved the challenge of helping police officers to solve crime and hope that with my assistance, the world around us was a little better place if only for a short time. Thank you. Um, the screen, sh uh, screen share. Okay, okay. okay so um, if there's any questions. Um, okay. Oh, you've got it. Well, okay, Jim. I'll start. Um, I, I listened and I never heard you use the word, which is on TV a lot these days, of forensics. Mm -hmm. Is that a separate service to the police force? Yes. Or it does is. it come under 
uh, the, the service or the department that you worked in, and you must work hand in hand with the forensic yes. side of it, I would think. I did. I dealt in information, forensics dealt with evidence. However, like you said, we certainly, um, uh, I had a close rapport with our, our forensic unit people, for sure. I was on the phone with them a lot. And actually my nephew is a forensics officer, so I still get information. <laughs> um, I, I think you had a question? <laughs> Does this work? Yeah, yes. wonderful. Thank you so much. I found that talk fascinating. Oh, yeah. It is a fascinating area just to listen to, but I was always under the impression that a lot of things that you described to us today were done by detectives. Maybe that's because of all the police shows on TV where there are detectives. And I never heard of civilians, that word being used mm -hmm. in conjunction with police work. So I'm curious, what is there a dividing line, a clear dividing line between detectives and what you've described that you've done? Yes. Is there a lot of overlap perhaps? Oh, perhaps? totally. We, we work very closely together and that's why I worked in the detective office. And uh, so, there's just so much information from so many different places. And for the officers who come in and they get assigned cases to follow up, and it's a lot of work. And contrary to what you see on TV, the paperwork is ridiculous. It takes a week to get a search warrant. I mean, um, so to have somebody like me, um, civilians are cheaper, but have somebody like me who can take uh, look at the bigger picture and pick out what I would think they needed, then it's, it was a great partnership. So, uh, and, and mostly it's civilians. They started out using police officers, but then you're sort of wasting their area of expertise, whereas civilians, and especially with all the technology, you have to constantly go to courses and be upgraded. And police officers can be used in other ways. So it, it, it works as a really, really good partnership. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question, Russ. Is it sound? Is it coming through okay on Zoom? Yes, it's uh, coming through fine. Are there any questions from the folks uh, attending via Zoom? You'll probably need to unmute yourselves if you have any. Meanwhile, any others here? Okay, I see two there. So, Zoom folks, hold on for a minute. <laughs> To what extent can the public help you with suspicious activity that you can then investigate? I had reported two suspicious activities on our street. A car drew up one day at lunchtime. Two suspicious men uh, let off a woman who went into a house on our street. They were there about an hour and then the woman came out and got back in. The reason I saw this was having a study on the second floor of the house. Mm -hmm. one of <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I sort of was suspicious about why two men had their lunch in a car and a woman went into a house. The next day, the same car, different woman, same two guys appeared and this woman went into that particular house. So I then on the uh, I then reported that day the activity, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, the third day the car didn't appear, but I did have the registration numbers of the of the car. The, the thing is, you never hear back from the police whether what happened to your reporting of mm -hmm. that activity. Well, and it's very, very frustrating that you don't know yes. what happened. Uh, was I being unduly suspicious of, of two guys and letting off a woman to go into a house? To me, it sounded like talking about prostitution. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't know. Like, so I, sh should you still encourage the public to report even though you never hear back? Definitely. Definitely, because that's the sort of thing that I would read. And maybe at that moment, it didn't mean anything, but especially because you had the vehicle and the plates, there is, there could be something that was going on in the area or that I would file away as a, a vehicle of interest and persons of interest. We love people that do that uh, because that's where, that was part of my job is getting all those bits and pieces of information. Now, getting back to you, a lot of times it's just, there's just too much. 
Uh, and, and unfortunately, the officers probably aren't as good at getting back to people. They just get lost in everything else that comes in. But definitely, definitely, it's always best to, uh, to call and let us know. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, but I have a couple of comments. People sent me emails, something were quite humorous. And this is the one where they had a police lineup, and they had these six guys in the lineup. And the officer that was in charge said, I want you to, I want, I want you to say, you know, each in turn, this is a hold up, give me all your money. Which one of the guys in the lineup said, that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so just like my uh, robbery guy that said, it's and not. The other, <laughs> and the other one is where the guy went into the bank, a hold up, and he had, didn't have a gun, he used his finger and his thumb. The problem was he forgot to put his hand in the pocket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is, these people vote and they bleed. <laughs> Uh, any other questions, comments? Or, or any questions from those on Zoom? No. Nope. We're a pretty quiet bunch out here. Great presentation. <laughs> Over the years, uh, over the years, the uh, matter of privacy has become uh, more of an issue in our society. And uh, I'm just wondering whether you noticed uh, a difference from your early career to your later career, uh, which fact that you, you were, didn't uh, have access to certain kinds of information that you might have had before. Mm -hmm. Or if you didn't have access to it, you couldn't really use it or uh, report it. And, uh, you know, you couldn't pass it on to officers and to the troops. Just, just wondering about that. Yep, that, that, that uh, did have a bit of an impact. Um, one example is Crime Stoppers, which is a great program. Um, and I would get the Crime Stoppers tip and, and read them every day. But I couldn't really use them for anything. However, um, I would be able to see if something that somebody was reporting on Crime Stoppers matched with something else, and then the detectives could have a look at that. But um, privacy in like social media was has always been a great source of information. And as people got smarter and started putting more privacy settings on their uh, social media accounts, it's harder for me to creep them. But uh, um, so yeah, things, things change, not always for the better. In, in general, probably it is better, but uh, when you're trying to find things out, maybe a little more difficult, so. Yeah, Brian, I think we have time for just one more question, Sorry. I think of Brian. Yeah. I think somebody on Zoom was asking too. Yeah, uh, tell me what. Go ahead. Go ahead, Don. Go ahead, Don. With this issue of privacy, the growing number of security cameras since the '70s, there's practically everyone. Not just every uh, Tim Hortons. So it's on every pillar post. Is there a, a growing um, use of facial recognition and legitimizing that? We didn't have, as far as when I was working, I wasn't aware that we had any facial recognition software. Uh, I know it was being used by some federal authorities, um, mainly for me and the officers, when you're talking about CCTV and surveillance cameras, it was basically looking at the camera and trying to figure out if we recognize that person or clothing ourselves. Um, I don't know if we've gotten any facial recognition software um, since I've been gone, but uh, it is becoming more widely used. Mm -hmm. One last one. Okay. Hi, uh, this is just a comment because you asked for comments as well, but you've uh, given us several examples to illustrate the lack of intelligence of some criminal strengthness. When I was doing my PhD at IV in London, this is the late 80s. There was a news report in the London Free Press that I thought was great. It was two guys decided to break into a 24 hour convenience store. They thought they were going to come down through the roof, and the clerk hollered, What the heck are you guys doing? 
They went back up through the roof and the police came and followed the footprints through the snow and the rest of the way in the park. <laughs> <laughs> Just so organized crime. <laughs> We're going to call on Duncan now to thank our speaker. Thank you. Uh, a quick first thank you. John Solomon, thank you for the uh, suggestion um, for um, Nancy to uh, make the presentation. Gratefully appreciate it. Nancy, you're not trusty. You're not. <laughs> Uh, I would say at all. It was a pleasure to uh, to have you speak, and the information was interesting. Um, I always try and take a takeaway from the presentation. So you know, my takeaway from yours is um, analysis, crime analysis. Um, not only did you get in on the ground floor, but I think what you've demonstrated is two things. More than two things. Mm -hmm. Two things I, I would mm -hmm. like to highlight. The uh, first one is um, being uh, able to um, uh, have a support group in place. I think the comment was made that uh, the police officers seem to get all of the high profile, but backing those police officers up, mm -hmm. one of the groups is crime analysis. Um, so uh, that was interesting and a great takeaway. The second part is in doing the crime analysis, there's a lot of people, like different crime analysis people in different regions and so forth. So there's a lot of other people doing what you were doing. Mm -hmm. The difference is you did it extremely well. In fact, you're the best of the best no. in terms of doing that. Look at the awards and look at the recognition. So uh, I guess my last comment was, uh, is that I think in terms of when you retired, where you replaced effectively, I'm not, it's a rhetorical question, mm -hmm. where you replaced effectively to make um, our community uh, as safe as it was while you were there because of your proactiveness, because of your ability to take information, put the pieces of the puzzle together and get that information out to officers who act successfully act upon it. So this is a thank you. And uh, it's a $30 gift certificate from LCBO oh. to give you a little <laughs> share. Oh, good. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you all.